Assistant Director at the Harris Center for Conservation Education. And along with four wonderful local libraries, local to us here in New Hampshire, the Jaffrey Public Library, the Peterborough Town Library, Keene Public Library, and the Hancock Town Library, we are really excited to sponsor this Women in Science speaker series. This is the inaugural talk, um, the first of five, same time, same place every Wednesday um, in March, which is Women's History Month. For those of you who might be new to the Harris Center, which I have a feeling might be some of you since you're, you're zooming in from far afield, we are a um, nonprofit land trust and environmental education center based in the Monadnock region of Southwest New Hampshire. And our work is really helping people fall in love with the natural world through land protection, conservation research, and education of all ages. So for those of you who are local to us, um, you, if you don't know already, might be interested to know we've protected more than 24,000 acres of land from development. Much of that's open to hiking and other recreation. Some of that land um, was one of the study sites for our presenter today, which is exciting. We support and coordinate conservation research on that land and throughout our region through a variety of community science projects. And really at the heart of everything we do is education from babies and backpacks to residents of assisted living communities and all points in between. And in this past year, we've made this grand leap into Zoom talks, which has enabled people to join us from all over the place, which is really wonderful. Um, so if you're, um, if you're I, I, I do see some familiar faces out there. If you're a Harris Center supporter, we always wanna thank you for making these sorts of talks possible. And if you're not yet, we encourage you to check us out at harriscenter.org. We've got a ton of really fun events coming up. And we're especially excited about this speaker series, working with our local libraries to bring this to you. So this is our very first talk, but we've got one every Wednesday um, in March. And so we hope that you'll join us for all of them. Next week, we have Kelly Luis, who is a marine scientist, a PhD student at UMass Boston. She's gonna be talking about the natural history of Boston Harbor in a talk called The Urban Ocean. The week after that, I believe we have Dr. Logan Brenner, who's a paleoclimatologist, going to be sharing with us how fossilized corals can help us learn about climate change and maybe envision our future. Um, the week after that, Chitty Page, who's a really exciting and vivacious STEM educator and game designer, talking about her kind of path through science learning. And then our, our final talk is um, one of my favorite cartoonists and one of the only nature cartoonists I know, Rosemary. Mosco of Bird and Moon Comics, who's going to talk about science communication and the funny side of nature. So these are all brought to you by um, not just the Harris Center, but also a bunch of library partners. And today we were um, wanting to especially welcome and feature the Jaffrey Public Library. And I think Andrea is here from Jaffrey and would like to welcome you as well and say a couple words. So Andrea, take it away. Thank you very much, Brett. Um, yeah, so my name is Andrea. I'm the assistant director at the Jaffrey Public Library um, in Jaffrey, New Hampshire. I'm so excited to see that there are people from far afield here today. That's, that's really cool. Um, we're really excited uh, to be part of the Women in Science series. Um, a huge thanks to the Harris Center for offering us the opportunity to co-host. Um, this is really cool that we have this chance on Zoom. And also a huge thanks to the libraries that are also partnered in this, the Hancock Town Library, um, like Brett mentioned, uh, the Keene Public Library, Peterborough Town Library. Um, it's a really unique series, so we're excited to be a part of it. Um, science education and eco-literacy are an important part of the Jaffrey Public Library's uh, lifelong learning and discovery mission. We actually are getting ready to launch our fifth annual seed library um, in a couple of weeks. And that is a chance for us to get free seeds out into the community. Um, we also in the past summer launched a whole bunch of STEAM kits, which are kits that focus on science, technology, engineering, arts and mathematics. So we had so much fun the last summer with uh, field science kits going out. People checked out field science kits with binoculars and, and nets and little uh, petri dish specimen jars and all sorts of, you know, ways to identify the local plants and the flora fauna, you know, in the Monadnock region. So we've had some fun with that. You can have things like Mars base camp kits. You can land your own Mars rover on the moon and 
um, sewing machines. Like there's, we have over a hundred kits so far. Um, another way that we like to explore different regions, we're, we're launching a spice club right now where people can check out a new spice every month and, and get a little taste of different areas. Um, we have book clubs for all ages from preschool through adult, which you know right now has adapted to being on Zoom. So there's a little bit of something for everyone on Zoom. Basically, we love science and discovery. Um, you'll see us running around in our lab coats. And um, uh, you may have, if you're local, you may have seen in the ledger transcript and in the Keen Sentinel recently that we launched our Mananoc Doll Hospital to promote health literacy. We're currently trying to vaccinate all of the dolls in the Mananoc region. Um, so science is really near and dear to our hearts. So we're, we're excited to be part of this Women in Science series and we're looking forward to hearing about milkweed and all of the fun things that go with it. We have a learning garden outside so we're getting ready to amp up for that spring growing season. I can't wait to hear what Katie has to say. So thanks for letting us be a part of it. Um, yeah, we're looking forward to it. Wonderful. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you, Jeffrey Public Library and all of our libraries. Please enjoy. All right, now to the, to the um, star of the show here. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Katie Galetta. She's a senior studying biology with a concentration in ecology, evolution, and marine biology at Bowdoin College in Maine. She completed Bowdoin's marine science semester program. She studied wildlife management and conservation for a semester in Tanzania and has spent summers as a research fellow at Bowdoin's Island Field Station in Canada and as a marine biology teaching intern at St. Paul's School in Concord. She also leads the Bowdoin Naturalist Club, runs trips for the Bowdoin Outing Club, and last year became a board trustee at Maine Audubon. So she has a really bright future in conservation. And we first met her when she was looking for field sites for conducting the research that she's going to share with you on monarchs um, and milkweed and other insects in the monarch milkweed um, ecosystem. And so we were really delighted that she conducted some of this research um, at local field sites, including some Harris Center, a Harris Center conserved milkweed patch in Peterborough and also the Fremont Field in Peterborough for those of you who are local and um, like to go walking. It's a beautiful spot to walk. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Katie and she's going to teach us all about monarchs, milkweed and more. Welcome, Katie. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Brett. Um, and to obviously huge thanks to the Harris Center, um, Jaffrey Public Library, and of course, everyone um, in the audience today. I am so blown away by how many of you there are. And it's very exciting to me um, because monarchs are very near and dear to my heart. I've got a fun little uh, milkweed village, milkweed insect community shirt on today. Um, so it's something that I care a lot about. And I'm super excited to get to talk to you um, today. Great. So um, as Brett said, I'm a student at Bowdoin College in Maine, and that's where I'm zooming to you from today. Um, but I'm originally from Goffstown, New Hampshire. And this summer, um, I conducted a field research project throughout Southern New Hampshire, looking at monarch egg laying preferences on milkweed plants. And so I'm going to uh, definitely talk to you about that later in my talk, um, but I'm also going to focus here today on the biology and ecology of the milkweed herbivore community and hopefully draw you into a little bit of the really interesting um, evolutionary drama that takes place right in our backyards every summer. So I'm willing to bet, um, based on how many of you there are in the audience today, uh, most of you are familiar with monarchs. Right. So as adults, there are these really super flashy, bright orange, beautiful, iconic signals that summer is well underway. They also just have really interesting life histories um, where two to three generations of monarchs will hatch throughout the summer and live only a few weeks just to wander around and mate. But then at the end of the summer, the final generation to hatch out is often called the Methuselah generation. And these are the ones that are going to migrate 3000 miles down to the mountains of central Mexico and live there throughout the winter until they return to the southern US in the spring. And this actually makes them the only two way migrating butterfly in the world. Regardless of which summer generation a monarch is a part of though, their development is the same. 
So they hatch out from a tiny egg that's usually laid alone on the underside of a fresh milkweed leaf. So here, this little inset, um, that is my fingertip for scale. This is a milkweed leaf, and this is the egg, and that is a freshly hatched out caterpillar. I watched that one eat its way out of its egg. Um, so as you can tell, they are incredibly small. And in order to grow into a healthy adult butterfly, these guys need to eat a whole lot and grow quickly enough to avoid getting eaten themselves. So this is not my photo, but I think it does a really good job of highlighting just how much these monarch caterpillars have to eat over the course of this life stage. And so the five different caterpillar growth stages are called instars. And these represent the development between molting as the caterpillars need to shed their skin in order to grow. Before making a chrysalis and turning into a butterfly, monarch caterpillar hatchlings actually grow 2,000 times in mass over the span of a couple of weeks. Um, obviously, as you can see here, that's the little egg. This is the freshly hatched caterpillar. And this is the stage that's going to actually make the chrysalis and turn into a butterfly. So obviously, very dramatic shift. But another super interesting fact about monarchs is that the caterpillars can only eat milkweed plants. If they run out of milkweed leaves or if somehow their mother lays an egg on a different kind of plant, the caterpillars simply won't make it. So let's take a look at the milkweed that monarchs are gonna eat around here. There's actually a whole bunch of different species of milkweeds and um, they're you know, all across uh, North America, there's a whole bunch of different kinds. And there's also um, several different species that are native to New England. Um, in New Hampshire and in Northern New England, um, by far, and throughout the Northeast really, um, by far the most common is called common milkweed, so Asclepia syriaca. And um, as the name suggests, in general, mil milkweeds are fast growing weedy plants that really love growing in fields and along roadsides especially. So in the middle of the summer, um, our common milkweed have these really beautiful sprays of pinkish purple flowers. Um, they smell wonderful and they attract a lot of pollinators. So you'll often see them surrounded by bees trying to drink their nectar. In addition to reproducing through seeds via pollination though, milkweed can also grow by sending shoots up from underground stems called rhizomes. So this is a picture that I took in the field this summer. And as you can see, um, the plants are often attached to their neighbors. And so they can form these really large clones, meaning that the all the stems that you see in this photo, they're all part of the same plant. They're all genetically identical and connected. Um, and this is what allows milkweed to spread relatively quickly from year to year. So even though monarchs are entirely dependent on milkweed, milkweed actually doesn't need monarchs to live at all. Um, monarchs are actually really bad milkweed pollinators, which I think surprises a lot of people. It definitely surprised me when I heard that. But it's because um, milkweed flowers have a very specific structure. They don't just have loose pollen grains like a lot of other flowers do. Um, instead, their pollen comes in these little sacs called pollinia, and they have a little sticky part. And so in order for the pollen sac to be removed from a flower, an insect's leg has to fall directly into a very specific slit on the side of the flower. And just the way that monarchs and a lot of other butterflies sit on the flowers as they're drinking the nectar, their legs don't ever really, or their, any part of their body really doesn't really come in contact um, with those pollen sacs. So this, the fact that monarchs can't, sometimes they can pollinate milkweed, it's just pretty rare. And so this in combination with the fact that the larvae are pretty much just little milkweed eating machines means that it's not really in the milkweed's best interest to uh, keep the monarchs around, right? It's going to kind of want to deter monarchs as best it can. Um, and, but luckily, um, when it comes to interacting with herbivores, plants aren't as passive as we often think that they are. And so milkweed has a few really interesting ways of actively defending itself against unwanted attacks. So milkweed uses three main forms of defense. So the, the main physical defense is latex, which is a sticky white milky substance that flows from a milkweed leaf when you break it, right? That's what it's named after, that's that milky part of its name. Milkweed plants have latex canals throughout their leaves, stems, and I, I think roots. And when it's exposed to the air, it gets gummy and adhesive very quickly. 
And so latex can actually glue together the mouth parts of a caterpillar and even drown hatchlings if they're unable to escape it, uh, which is what's happening in this photo here. You can see um, there was some damage on the leaf and the latex flowed down and it just gets so sticky that the caterpillars oftentimes can't escape it. So another physical defense mechanism is the presence of trichomes, which are these tiny little plant hairs that milkweed has on the underside of its leaves. So you can kind of see there's like a fuzzy texture here. This is looking at the underside of a leaf. And this is definitely more pronounced in some other species of milkweed. There are some species um, in Southern California and in the Southwest that are really, really furry. And as you can imagine, that makes it pretty hard for a caterpillar to eat. Um, but even on the milkweed that we have around here, oftentimes the caterpillars have to take the time and energy to kind of shave those trichomes down in order to actually access the nutritious part of the leaf. So finally, milkweed's best studied defense is the production of toxins called cardinalides, which are found in all parts of the plant and even the nectar. These are chemicals um, that interfere with an animal's sodium potassium pump, which is responsible for controlling things like heartbeats and other nervous system functions. And so because of that, they can be fatal if enough are ingested. Um, usually, animals that are eating these toxins, it, it takes a lot to actually have those effects, but at lower doses, it's really, really bitter and induces vomiting. So if you're an herbivore, you probably don't want to be consuming much milkweed because of these toxins, unless of course you're a milkweed specialist like monarchs. In that case, um, it gets a little bit more complicated than that, of course, as these things often do. So since monarchs are specialists, right? They only eat milkweed. They've adapted cardenolide insensitive sodium pumps, which means that they're not as directly affected by these toxins. Um, now, when a plant has a particularly strong concentration, which uh, is also more common in other milkweed species, monarch's development does get slowed way down and then um, they're left for longer as an exposed caterpillar um, and more prone to predation. But on the note of predation, uh, you might have heard that monarchs are brightly colored as adults and as caterpillars in order to advertise that they taste bad to predators. And this is totally correct. Um, and the reason that monarchs taste bad is because they've evolved the ability to store these milkweed cardinalides in their own tissues. Uh, so this, you know, they basically munch on the leaves, take those toxins in and store them in their bodies in a process called sequestration. So as caterpillars, they process cardinalides from the leaves that they're eating, and they remain stored in their bodies throughout metamorphosis so that the adults are distasteful too. And so you're probably wondering why I've got pictures of a blue jay up on the screen, but to help visualize this, I've taken a few uh, pictures from a classic monarch study from 1967. So what's happening in these pictures is, um, the, the researchers wanted to kind of get an idea of why monarchs were distasteful because they knew that they were, but they wanted to explore why. And so to do this, they would feed blue jays adult monarch butterflies. And you'll notice here, it takes the wings off because if you think about it, the wings don't really have any nutritional value, right? They're just, it would be like, you know, eating our hair. Um, so he just wants that really juicy stuff in the middle. So he's going to eat the, the monarch and the researchers would wait a few minutes to see what happens. And then after a few minutes, uh, the birds would vomit. And this happened every single time they ran these trials um, without fail. This, you know, the, the blue jays would swallow the bugs and it just would not stay down because of those cardinalides. But they didn't know that yet. And so then they fed different blue jays monarchs that had eaten a species of milkweed with no cardinalides present. They knew, th they knew that cardinalides existed and that they were in milkweed. So they wanted to see, is it the caterpillar itself that was making the, um, the monarch or is it the monarchs themselves that are making them distasteful or is it the milkweed that monarchs are eating? So by feeding the blue jays monarchs that hadn't eaten cardinalides, as you can imagine, those, those uh, birds did not throw up. And so this was one of the early studies that led to our current understanding of milkweed chemical ecology and how that's going to impact um, the broader ecology of these insects. And also I'm you know, just very partial to really good um, scientific paper figures. And this is, this is probably one of the best I've seen. <laughs> so 
It's been demonstrated that monarchs likely evolved this ability to tolerate cardenolides in order to sequester them for their own defense so that they wouldn't get picked off by hungry blue jays or other potential predators. Over time, as the cardenolide tolerant caterpillars kept on munching on those milkweed leaves, the plant increased its defenses and got more toxic. And so, as you can imagine, this would require monarchs to invest more energy into coping with these toxins and so on. So this process is called co-evolution, where two species are interacting and influencing each other's evolution. So here are just two ways to envision this same process as it pertains to the evolutionary history of monarchs and milkweed. So you can think of it like a cycle here on the left where the plant increases its defenses and then the caterpillar in turn is increasing its ability to cope with those and it's just gonna go around and around. Or on the right, you can think of it as an arms race um, where they're just kind of both, um, you know, battling it out as it would be um, to, to get there. And so with this, remember, this has taken place over a very long um, evolutionary time, but um, it's a really, really interesting process. And there's been a lot of work done on understanding, you know, how this happened and why. What makes this system really interesting though is that monarchs aren't the only insects to eat milkweed. Um, there are actually 10 other insect species here in the Northeast that have co-evolved with milkweed and are adapted to withstand its toxins enough to make a living off of it. Um, so there's a lot of plants that have, you know, maybe hundreds of insects that are going to eat it. Milkweed's really interesting. It's because of those cardinalides and, you know, the latex and things like that. It's a pretty hard plant to you know, have that be the only thing that you eat. Um, but because it has such specialized defenses, there's a very small, this is a very small um, group of insects that have actually been able to evolve to deal with that. Um, so of these insects, and again, these are pretty much the only insects that eat milkweed around here. So it's pretty cool. And so there's, we've got three different species of beetles, two true bugs. This is, um, these are caterpillars from a moth. Um, this is damage from a fly, which is really interesting. We'll get to that in a minute. And then we've got three different species of aphids. And this is really cool because these are five different insect families, yet they all convergently evolved ways of eating what is clearly a pretty tough plant. So again, it's always fun for me to go into a milkweed patch. You kind of get to know the same cast of characters, right? So once you're able to identify these species, um, it's really exciting to see who's there and who's not and who's interacting with who. So let's learn how to identify some of them. We'll start with the aphids. Um, I'm sure if I've got some gardeners uh, in the audience right now, um, sometimes we're not always big fans of aphids hanging out on all of our milkweed. Um, but there's some native species, you know, they've evolved to do this. And so um, they've got a right to be there too. And so the, we've got the three different species around here. And what's interesting about these ones is that they've all, um, they're all active at slightly different parts of the summer. So one species, Aphis escopiatus, this one's particularly interesting to me at least, um, because you'll notice that we've got an ant in this picture here. And so what's going on with that is, um, this species is actually often part of a mutualistic relationship with ants. So the ants are going to provide the aphids with protection against predation. So if another insect comes near the aphids, the ants are going to try to defend them so that the aphids won't get eaten. But then in return, um, the aphids, the ants are able to consume aphid honeydew, um, which is a polite name for the excretions that aphids produce as they process plant juices. So if you see um, these aphids asclepiatus, they generally have ants um, near them, which is a good way of identifying them. Although sometimes um, these aphids nerii or the oleander aphids, sometimes they'll also have ants with them, but these ones are really distinctive because they're bright yellow. And then these ones are pretty nondescript. They um, they're almost translucent. They're really hard to see unless you're looking, but that makes it fun to find them. So next we have the seed eaters. So these two, the large and the small milkweed bugs um, are also probably somewhat familiar um, because these ones will colonize plants and lay their eggs in the seed pods. And then over the summer, as those larvae grow out, um, you'll see just massive clusters of them around the seed pods of older plants. And so these ones are more common around late August, um, September time. 
I doubt that many people are familiar with this milkweed stem weevil though. And, you know, clearly they're just kind of this flat black. They're not super easy to spot. Um, they're just small little black beetles and they're also nocturnal, um, which I was really excited to get to learn about this this summer. I didn't know um, that they even existed really. And so um, it was exciting. I actually got to have, I believe it was like, the first five or six observations of th these beetles in New Hampshire um, listed on the iNaturalist app, which is a really cool app um, for documenting species observations. And so it's not that they haven't been around, um, it's just that people aren't often looking for them. So if you want a challenge, go out to a milkweed patch at night with a flashlight and see if you can see these guys. Um, and so their larvae are seed eaters in the fall, but um, the adults do eat leaves, and so their damage is pretty recognizable because they always gouge, sorry, they always gouge these giant holes um, along the main vein of the leaf under here. And um, they also cause some really distinctive stem damage, but I didn't actually see any of that this summer, so I don't have a photo. So finally, we have the leaf eaters and um, these ones are also pretty distinctive, um, not only because of their coloration, but also the damage that they leave. So um, these guys are probably pretty familiar if you've got a milkweed patch because these milkweed tussock moth caterpillars are really, really good at stripping entire milkweed plants of their leaves. Um, as you can see in this, this picture, I know it's kind of small, but we've got a whole bunch of little tiny um, young caterpillars and they've pretty much just skeletonized this leaf. So as you can imagine, as they get older and bigger and hungrier, they just destroy all the leaves on your milkweed plants. So leaf mining flies have this very distinctive type of damage where they almost look like blisters on the leaves. And so that's because if you were to actually tear open that leaf, you would be able to find a tiny little fly larvae munching on the leaf tissue between the outer layers. So the adult flies, which I've also never seen, they're just little black flies flying around the milkweed patch. But what they'll do is they'll um, lay an egg in between the layers of the leaf. And then the larvae is going to hang out in the middle and um, sort of eat that leaf tissue and grow up until it's able to um, leave the leaf and become the adult fly. So I know that a lot of gardeners get concerned that these leaf blemishes are a disease or something like that. Um, but in reality, it's just little larvae. Um, they're, they're relatively unsightly. I know some of my swamp milkweed this summer had a pretty bad infestation on one of them. Um, but in reality, they're not really likely to harm your milkweed plants at all. So if you're okay with it, just let them be. Um, again, these are all native species that have evolved to make a living on these plants. and um, none of them are really going to cause any major damage to your milkweed. So next we've got the four-eyed milkweed beetles and they're so named because if you look closely, you can kind of see it in this picture, their eyes are actually bisected by their antennae. So their antennae, for whatever reason, I don't really think we know why, but their antennae evolved to kind of grow in the middle of their eyes. So they have four eyes. Um, and so they also have a very distinctive damage pattern, which is this sort of U-shaped or V-shaped notch right at the tip of the leaves. And they also, um, kind of similar to what that uh, milkweed stem weevil was doing, um, instead of gouging holes in the main vein of the leaf, they've got these little mouth parts, little sniffing mouth parts. And what they'll do is they'll go along the leaf um, a little bit before the tip of the leaf and they'll use their little pinchers to cut little holes along the side of the vein. And so what this is going to allow them to do is like I had mentioned, those latex canals are all through the plant and they're all slightly pressurized. So if you were to just snip a little bit, you're gonna get a big, especially if you're a little insect, right? It's gonna be a big gush of latex coming out at you. And you don't really want that because you just wanna eat the leaf. You don't wanna eat the latex. So what they're going to do is they're going to cut little holes, break that pressure, allow the latex to drain out a little bit. And then by the time they're actually going to eat um, the leaf tissue at the tip of the leaf, a lot of the latex will have drained out. So they're able to really focus more on that nutritional um, uh, tissue in that leaf instead of the latex. And then lastly, we have the swamp milkweed leaf beetle. Um, and even though it's called the swamp milkweed leaf beetle, it's going to eat common milkweed as well. Um, and they kind of look like big ladybugs. Um, so they're really beautiful. They're an earlier season species and they don't have just, their damage is not quite as distinctive, but 
in a similar way um, to a lot of the other leaf eaters. They just kind of munch around. Um, and I think that they're really beautiful. And then of course, uh, finally, monarchs are also leaf eaters. Um, so here's a really cool picture I took this summer of the two distinctive forms of herbivory damage that monarchs produce. So this little round one with latex around it is characteristic of a very young monarch, likely in the first few days after hatching out of its egg. And then this broader uh, cut across the whole width of the leaf, this is from an older caterpillar. So if you look um, right there, you'll notice that the main vein of the leaf has been snipped. And in the inset image here, if you look closely, what this caterpillar is doing is it's cutting a notch in that vein. And so this one's doing it right at the base of the leaf. For some reason, this caterpillar decided to do it in the middle of the leaf. But that's the same exact thing as what that four-eyed beetle was doing, where it's going to allow latex to drain out, and it's just going to be able to eat some nice latex-free leaf and make it a little bit more palatable. So in light of all of these insects, right, that was 11 insects in a very short amount of time. Um, but as you saw, they all have slightly different feeding behaviors. And so it's really interesting to look at the concept of herbivory induced defense in milkweed. Um, so induced defense is the process by which a plant responds to the physical and chemical cues from herbivory damage by increasing its defense mechanisms. So think back to those different uh, defense mechanisms I showed you, right? Especially the cardenolides and the latex. And so these are defenses that common milkweed has to some degree all of the time. Um, but milkweed is also able to ramp up their production when it's under attack. So plants get signals from herbivory damage, whether that's the mechanical loss of leaf tissue, that would be the same as if you were to take scissors and snip a leaf, or a chemical cue from an insect saliva. But either way, a plant is going to take those cues or the combination of those cues and hopefully, in, or at least hopefully for the plant, respond in a way that's going to deter other herbivores from eating its tissues and causing more damage. Research has shown, however, that herbivory by different species on milkweed can induce different defenses, which can then lead to different cascading effects on the herbivores that choose to consume the plant later on. So, I'm a senior right now and in the biology department, I decided I want to conduct um, an honors thesis. And so this summer uh, we're gonna get into sort of what I was looking at and all of that. And so for my thesis research though, I wanted to do something that would let me hang out with monarch butterflies. And so um, I got to you know learn a whole bunch about like plant chemistry and this milkweed um, herbivore community. And after learning about those things, I really wanted to better understand how this herbivory damage and its induced responses impacts the insects in the milkweed community. So that was sort of my broad question. And then to look at that, I asked two main research questions. So first, how does leaf herbivory impact a monarch's egg laying decisions? So going back to when I was talking about like monarch biology early on, right? Monarch caterpillars need to eat milkweed almost as soon as they hatch. And so it's up to monarch moms to lay their eggs on plants that are going to feed her offspring and nourish them to adulthood. So adult females, when they land on a plant, they're actually able to smell and taste some of the chemical cues that the plant's giving off. And so they can kind of make an informed decision um, by perceiving the plant's chemistry. And we have to be careful. It's not really a conscious decision, right? It's not like the butterfly is thinking, oh, this one smells great, so I'm gonna lay an egg. But in general, she's able to take in those cues and ultimately um, decide whether or not to lay an egg there. And so as we've discussed, we know that herbivory changes plant chemistry. And so I wanted to see if I could see the effect of this on monarch behavior in the field as they're laying eggs. So I also wanted to look at this question through the lens of insect flower visitation. So lots of insects visit flowers to drink nectar. And usually in biology, we think of nectar as being a sweet reward in exchange for pollination services, right? If you want to get pollinated and continue to reproduce, you're probably going to want to offer those pollinators a nice little snack uh, to reward them and make them want to come pollinate you. However, since milkweed cardinalides can be found in nectar, and again, cardinalides generally make things distasteful, I wanted to see how leaf herbivory impacted the number of insects visiting milkweed flowers through the defenses that they induce. 
Now you'll probably um, notice I'm not just calling these insect flower visitors pollinators. And that's because lots of insects like to drink the milkweed nectar. But like I mentioned with the monarch butterflies, not all of them are actually very effective pollinators. Um, in general, large bodied bees and wasps, a lot of bumblebees, um, those are really the only insects that are actually able to successfully pollinate milkweed and deposit um, that pollen in another flower. However, the idea behind this specific research question is that by looking at all the insect visitors, we can sort of get an idea of how the nectar quality may be affected by the induced defense following herbivory. Okay, so to test my monarch egg question in the field, um, like Brett had mentioned at the beginning, I collaborated with dozens of conservation commissions, environmental groups, and private landowners to look at 33 milkweed fields throughout southern New Hampshire. So these sites included land managed by New Hampshire Audubon, the Society for the Protection of New Hampshire Forests, um, of course the Harris Center, and also a whole lot of local town conservation commissions. And these sites ranged from Peterborough all the way to Portsmouth. Um, and remember, I live in Goffstown right over here. And so it was really exciting for me to get to drive around southern New Hampshire and really get to know um, a lot of open spaces that I had never been to before. The flower visitation question, however, was actually worked on by another student in my biology department named Deva Holloman. And so Deva conducted her surveys in central North Carolina. Um, and she used nine sites, primarily in state and local parks in the Raleigh-Durham area. So she was working on a fellowship um, with my advisor, doing a separate project. And by the time I got back in the fall and we were looking at data analysis for my own um, egg laying questions, we decided to pull the data um, because she was asking some really interesting pollination questions. So, for my surveys, I did a total of 59 between July and mid-September, and each one involved me looking at up to 60 milkweed plants per visit. So for each plant, I took a whole bunch of measurements, um, but in particular, I counted the number of leaves damaged by herbivores and identified the herbivory damage to species, and also counted the number of monarch eggs and caterpillars on each plant. So as you can see in this photo, again, they're really small. That is my thumb and that is a newly hatched out monarch caterpillar. Um, so that was tricky on its own, um, but also for the purposes of my data analysis, um, it, was, it was kind of helpful because I was able to group eggs and these very young caterpillars together to kind of almost boost my sample size. Um, since when they're this small, they're not really able to move off of, the leaf, uh, off of the plant that they hatched out on. So their relative immobility allows them to sort of be proxies for where a female monarch decided to lay an egg. And then for the flower visitor surveys in North Carolina, the number of leaves damaged by herbivores were counted on each plant. And for the plants that were actively in bloom, the insects that visited the flowers over a 90 second period were counted and identified. So I did this data collection over the summer and then um, my, my honors work is basically, it was out throughout the fall, throughout all of winter break and is going to continue until May when I've got my final report. And so I'm still working on a lot of the data analysis. Um, but over the fall, I was able to do some preliminary stuff. And so that's what we're going to talk about right now. And so based off of the work that I've done so far, my models show that monarchs prefer to lay eggs on plants with no herbivory damage. Now, I still need to refine this a bit, but it also seems that the amount of damage doesn't really matter, right? It's not a linear relationship where monarchs prefer to lay eggs on plants with no damage um, and not, you know, they prefer not to lay eggs on plants with a lot. It's like, if there's any damage, they prefer not to lay an egg there. Um, and I believe that this is because in theory, a monarch mom is going to try and choose a nutritious plant that's going to allow her offspring to grow quickly, right? And we're thinking that means it's got fewer cardenolides in it. And so we would expect there to be less damage. But she also is going to want one that has enough cardenolides for her caterpillars to sequester in order to protect themselves against predation, right? Think back to those blue jay photos. Those toxins obtained as a caterpillar serve a really important role throughout the entire life of a monarch. So it's a trade-off that female monarchs have to unconsciously make. And so um, 
I really want to keep digging into this result to see if I can find whether damage from any particular herbivore species have more of an impact on monarch egg laying or if they perceive all herbivory damage the same. So that's what I'm working on this semester. So for my second question, um, the insect flower visitation results were also really interesting. And this is actually, I believe, the first study to show that more flower visitors visit flowers on milkweed with less leaf damage, which is really cool. And so if you'll remember, um, this doesn't necessarily mean that the plants are being pollinated less. So my next steps are now to look at in, uh, in greater detail, which insects in particular were visiting milkweed blooms with high and low numbers of leaf damage. So uh, for example, I wanna see if those large bodied bees, which are the effective pollinators for milkweed, I want to see if they show different visitation patterns than say monarch butterflies. And you know, if it's the monarch butterflies and small bees that are no longer coming to milkweed blooms after herbivory, that's probably not going to have too much of an effect on milkweed reproduction. But if it is those large bees that are the ones choosing not to visit after herbivory, then that could indicate a trickier trade-off that the plants are facing. So again, all in all, my honors thesis is still very much a work in progress, but by the end of the semester, I'll be all done with my analysis and report and all of that. And um, I'm hoping that we'll have a better understanding of how uh, plant chemistry is going to um, mediate interactions between the milkweed insect herbivore community in the field. And I'm also hoping that through our little journey today, looking at milkweed's defenses, monarch coevolution, milkweed herbivores, and their impact on some of our most iconic insects, that everyone here now has a slightly better understanding of some of the complex and endlessly interesting interactions that take place right in our backyards every summer. And I think it's really cool that we've got people from all over the place, because there are so many different species of milkweed that are, um, you know, the Southwest has a really cool, um, a group of species and like I know the Rocky Mountains has some really cool ones and so regardless of where you're listening in from today um, I really want everyone once it gets warmer and once we kind of start seeing um, milkweed pop back up go take a look at you know what species are there and what insects are there um, because it's, it's been a lot of fun for me doing this project and learning so much and of course getting to share with everyone so before I wrap it up, I just need to um, acknowledge all the help that I got on this project. Um, of course, thanking my advisor, Dr. Patty Jones, who was a pollinator um, behavioral ecologist here at Bowdoin, as well as Deva Holloman, who um, was the other student working on the pollination questions, the insect visitation questions rather. And I'd also like to extend a gigantic thank you to everyone I worked with in New Hampshire this summer, including the folks who came out on surveys with me, um, Brett, as well as uh, Karen Seaver with the Harris Center, um, as well as a whole bunch of other folks from different organizations, as well as, um, you know, to take pictures of me and write science communication pieces about my work and, you know, invite me to do things like this today. And obviously I had a whole bunch of help from the dozens of people whose properties I was able to collect all of my data. And finally, I, it's just really important for me to recognize and honor the fact that this research was conducted on indigenous lands. And so in New Hampshire, I was working on the traditional territorial lands of the Penacook and Pentucket people of the Wabanaki Confederacy. And Deva's work was on the traditional territorial lands of the Tuscarora and Shikori peoples in North Carolina. So with all of this gratitude, I'd finally like to thank all of you for coming to my talk today and also open up the floor for questions. Thank you, everyone. Wow, thank you so much, Katie. We are all blown away. There's like all of these comments coming in about how impressed people are and um, thankful for you sharing your work. And there's a million questions too that you've, you've sparked for people. So I'm not sure if we'll have time for all of them, but um, we're gonna try to get through some of them to get um, give this chance for, for for people to um, get their questions answered. So let me kind of, but really just incredible, incredible presentation. Thank you so much. One question I had while I'm, while I'm kind of going through my list here is, um, and this is really, there's actually two related questions. People want to know where can they read your thesis when you're done? Is it going to be published anywhere for them to read? And my question is, when are you going to make a field guide to identify herbivory damage on milkweed, but to species? Because I think both of those would be really interesting things for people to read. 
Yeah. So like I said, my thesis isn't going to be finalized until um, probably the middle or end of May. Um, but I believe it will be public access. And so, um, you know, I don't know. I, I'll definitely send it to you, Brett, because you're one of my site contacts. Um, but I believe it will be available through the Bowdoin Library <laughs> as of probably sometime this summer. So we should um, be able to, to share that on, on social media or something when it's published. Yeah. We can share the link so people can, can find it. Yeah, um, and my advisor is also uh, talking about possibly getting this published in, in a journal. So we will see if that pans out, if I have time to write that manuscript. Um, but there's the potential for that, although that would probably be a little ways out in the future. I strongly encourage that for sure. Okay, so um, Linda would like to know, she's interested in other plants besides milkweed to help monarchs like food for flight. Are there important plants people should be putting in their gardens? Yeah, that's a really wonderful question. And I'm really glad that you brought that up. Um, so again, monarchs only need milkweed really um, as caterpillars because once they're adults, they can eat any other um, flowers pretty much as long as they're able to kind of manipulate it in the way that they need to. And so um, for all pollinators, it's really important when you're planting your garden every summer and spring and summer, um, try to get species that are going to be flowering in the early spring and the late fall, because usually in the middle of the summer, there's a whole bunch of stuff blooming and, you know, food's not super scarce, but it's really those bookends, um, especially with climate change and the way, um, that the timing of everything is sort of shifting, um, especially, you know, in response to, um, or in relationship to when the insects are coming out versus when the food's around, really try to plant those native species that are going to be early spring, late fall, and that'll be super helpful. And I'll put a little pitch in. The Harris Center has a demonstration pollinator garden that's maintained by a team of amazing volunteers, and they planned that garden with kind of continuous blooming in mind. So from, I, I guess, April, May, all the way through October, and we do have a plant list on our website for if folks are looking for ideas for things they could plant in the late season and early season. Um, so Tatiana asked, do all species of milkweed have the same tendency to form these large clonal colonies, or do some do this more readily than others? She says, I have some nice clumps of swamp milkweed, but they don't seem to be spreading like the common milkweed does. Yeah, that's another really wonderful question. So I'm actually not sure off the top of my head if swamp milkweed is clonal, um, but I know that uh, butterfly milkweed, which is that orange one, um, Ascopius tuberosa, that one is not clonal. So it really depends on the species. Um, I believe that most of them are not. And so that's kind of what makes our common milkweed uh, really interesting. Um, not sure about swamp milkweed though. That's a really good question. That is a good question. I would, I would, I would think it's not, but not I don't sure. tend to see it growing in the same kind of, no, it doesn't not, really, not that same density that you see in these patches. Right. Um, Linda asks, what is the time coordination between egg laying for monarchs and tussock moths? Like, do they overlap? Yeah. So both of them are happening kind of throughout the summer. Um, monarchs, you know, by the time they get to New Hampshire, at least it's generally like you know, late June, more like early to mid July, at least for this season. Um, whereas the tussock moths, um, because they're not migratory, I think that they start laying eggs slightly earlier, but they're both kind of throughout the summer. How many eggs do monarchs lay at once? This is from Emma. one. <laughs> one. Yeah, great question. It's generally one. Sometimes you'll come across, um, and you know, so th by that I mean like per plant. Um, so they'll have a whole bunch of eggs and then it's really interesting if you come across a monarch that's kind of like going, you know, flitting between these different um, plants and you can kind of watch and see exactly where she's laying eggs and that's probably um, if you've never like found monarch eggs before obviously they're really tiny really hard to see but that's a really good way of finding them, because you can kind of just see that a, a female is laid um, or has sat on a plant. Um, but yeah, they lay one at a time. Sometimes you come across a plant with like two on the same leaf or two on different leaves. Or I think one time I had three on one leaf. That was really exciting, but they don't lay them in clusters like uh, a lot of other insects do. Great. Thank you. Um, Beth, Beth Caldwell asked about monarch populations in general. Are they on the decline? 
They are. Um, not sure if anyone saw this, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so there's the Eastern population of monarchs, which is obviously the ones that we have. And then there's also a smaller subpopulation of in California. The one in California is doing really, really poorly this year. Um, over, over the past, you know, several years, the um, the monarch populations are generally tracked by the amount that come or that go to Mexico, like when they're overwintering, that's really the easiest way for people to monitor populations on a year to year basis. And so um, over the past, I don't know, decade, probably more, it has generally been on a decline um, to the point where this, for the past couple of years, um, monarchs have sort of been under review for becoming endangered species. And so this year, um, the group that's responsible for that decided that they can keep on, you know, reviewing it in the future, but that they're not endangered yet. Um, but it's pretty scary because, um, you know, it's not necessarily that the monarchs are going to all die off, but a big part of their um, migration is, is um, pretty endangered. And so, Yes, they're under decline, and that's why you know it's important to not only just plant milkweed, but also remember that climate change has a lot to do with this, um, and land use changes and things like that. So it's a really um, complicated issue. I'll I'll put in a little pitch for anyone who's local to us and is interested in helping to kind of monitor monarch populations over time. Last summer we started. Um, doing some monarch caterpillar monitoring at the um, Peterborough Community Garden Milkweed Patch, which is conserved by the Harris Center with the help of our community science volunteers as part of a national project, the Monarch Larvae Monitoring Project. And we will definitely be planning a field day for that again this um, coming summer. Usually, I think the, the week, the big Monarch BioBlitz week is the end of July. So keep an eye out for that if it's something you're interested in helping. And you can also do that on your own Monarch patches from wherever you are, you can contribute to this Monarch Larvae Monitoring Project. They collect data from all throughout North America to help understand some of these changes that are happening in populations. Um, okay, Richard asks, what's the advantage for milkweed to make it hard to pollinate except by large bodied insects? Great question. Um, so one of the kind of theories behind that is if you can only be pollinated in a very specific way or by certain insects, then you're going to kind of be able to form a relationship with that pollinator. And so it's sort of about pollinator fidelity, right? Um, and so that's kind of the theory behind that. I think another thing that's interesting to think about with common milkweed at least is because they are clonal, they don't necessarily need to be um, pollinated quite as much, right? Because they're still able to expand their clones, although obviously for genetic diversity, it's still important. Um, but also other milkweeds have similar, it's similarly difficult. So it's, I think I'll, the big thing is generally pollinator fidelity. That's really interesting thought. So here's a question from Patty, which is something that I, th I think is a question people who study monarchs probably hear a lot because people love monarchs, but not everybody loves aphids or the other insects that live um, alongside monarchs on milkweed. And so the, her question is, should aphids be left on milkweed? And I would extend that to say, all these other species you talked about, um, I think that there's are people out there who want to protect the milkweed for the monarchs by removing other herbivores from the plants. And what do you think, what would you say to that? Yeah, so I personally would just leave them. Um, like I said, they're not really going to be, um, they're all native. Um, well, the, the, the oleander aphids are kind of, there's a bit of history with them. I don't believe that they're actually fully native, but they've been around for a while. But the aphids at the very least, I don't believe they're going to be impacting the milkweed enough to really damage it for the monarchs. And especially, you know, since monarchs are generally laying their eggs or at least the eggs that are going to be viable and able to kind of survive further on um, earlier in the summer, right? If they're laying them in, you know, by September, those those caterpillars aren't going to make it. Um, so we're thinking more about the ones being laid midsummer. At that point, aphids aren't going to be able to do that much damage. Um, I would say I I definitely understand the frustration with things like the tussock moths because they really are able to um, decimate some a whole bunch of milkweed very quickly. And I would say if you really want to get rid of it, then like find a big 
area, um, you know, maybe the Peterborough uh, Community Garden has a really, really gigantic patch of um, milkweed and see if you can maybe relocate them instead of just killing them um, is probably what I would say. But personally, in my garden, I tend to just leave them um, because as much as the monarchs need it, I, I feel like at my house, I've got enough milkweed near me that um, the other insects need to, to get that too. That's a, a great response. I've seen a lot of frustrated entomologists kind of um, talking about sacrificing other insects for the sake of monarchs in people's gardens. Um, so one, uh, we probably won't have time for everyone's questions, but this one, um, I'll try to get to a few more from Nancy. Do monarchs prefer one species of milkweed over another? Yeah, that's a really wonderful question. I know that there's been um, a whole bunch of studies, particularly in the Midwest, because there's some really cool milkweed diversity out West. Um, I would say around here, I mean, it's really like common milkweed because there's just so much of it. Um, but I know that they really like swamp milkweed. But what's interesting with that is that swamp milkweed actually has lower levels of cardinalines. So they're slightly less protected. Um, and I think that they also don't quite grow as fast, which is not to say don't plant swamp milkweed. Um, you know, it's still good. But um, there are definitely a bunch of studies that have looked at specifically like a whole range of like eight plants and figured it out, but I don't know them off the top of my head. Okay, let's see, I'm trying to pick. One last, well, so a few people are wondering if you're off to graduate school after this. No, I need to give myself a break. <laughs> um, I'm trying to go live somewhere fun and relax a little bit because I work too hard. Um, but I do want to go to grad school at some point. Um, probably, you know, in a year, probably more like two or three years. I would love to go to graduate school for um, conservation ecology. I'm really interested in ultimately going into the field of environmental education and conservation outreach. Um, my work with the Maine Audubon has been really fun for me. And obviously doing things like this are my absolutely my favorite part of um, doing this kind of research. And so ultimately I'll get there. But for now, I'm going to you know take a little bit of rest. I think I need it. That's wise. All right. Last question from eight-year-old Patrick is how long do monarchs live? Yeah, awesome question. Thanks, Patrick. Um, so over the summer, they're only going to live for a couple weeks because really all they need to do is grow from a little egg to a caterpillar to the butterfly and then they mate and lay eggs again. Um, but that last generation in the summer is going to live several months, right? So they're going to be hatched out, you know, let's say in New Hampshire, you know, late August. And then they're going to go to all the way down to Mexico, hang out in the mountains with all the other monarchs, and then they're going to fly back to the southwest. Um, and that'll probably happen. I don't know, probably let's say March. I don't really know exactly when they <laughs> start flying back. Um, but so that last generation is going to live for a few months um, and then start the cycle all over again. Awesome. All right, there are, there are more questions we couldn't get to. I would say if, if you Google the Monarch Joint Venture, there's a ton of really great information. And I think you can also get those shirts. Some people were asking about where to get the shirt you have. I think you can get that through the Monarch Joint Venture as yeah, well. This one's from Liberty Graphics, just shout out. They're from Maine, um, really great. They've got a whole bunch of Monarch shirts actually. <laughs> awesome. Um, so get your Monarch shirts, get your Monarch info. And um, Thank you to everyone for coming and thank you especially to Katie for a, a truly excellent kickoff for our series. We're, we're really grateful for your time and enthusiasm and expertise um, and um, you just did, a, did an outstanding job. So if we, if we were here in person, we'd all be clapping and possibly giving you a standing ovation, but it's Zoom so you can't hear it. Um, but we really are grateful, um, grateful for everything you've shared with us today.